Till Dawn continue on Channel 5 with Island of Lost Souls. Welcome to Movies Till Dawn, a new podcast that's a safe space for filmmakers to talk about the fascinating and exasperating, and always unusual and never quite the same thing twice process of creating motion pictures. I'm Raymond DeFelita, and I'm the show's Toastmaster General. So here's part two of my conversation with Nancy Savoca and her husband and collaborator, Richard Gay. Um, in this part, we discuss what I think of as the ultimate Nancy Savoca statement movie. It's called Household Saints. Uh, and it stars Vincent D'Onofrio, Lily Taylor, uh, and Tracy Ullman. And I realize I keep applying the word indescribable to, to Nancy's films, but this time I really mean it. Uh, it. Household Saints is dark, it's romantic, it's tragic, it's funny, it's surreal, uh, and yet realistic. Anyway, find a copy and see it. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, of the um, of part one of this, uh, it will be coming out again soon. It just had not made it to DVD, which is ridiculous over the years. Um, there really isn't a movie that you can say is similar to Half Sold Saints. It's a one of a kind film, um, and we talk about Rich and Nancy's commitment to helping filmmakers get the rights to their older movies untangled so that they can be seen again. Um, they have formed a group called Missing Movies. Um, See, when you make an independent movie, it's usually financed by a few different people, uh, a couple of, you know, companies that are sort of fly by night. Sometimes they're there, they pretty much always go away and disappear, and then who knows who really owns anything. Uh, and that's why so many of the movies of the 80s and 90s independent uh, film world are just, they're missing. They're they are not around, but um, Nancy and Rich and other filmmakers uh, are devoted to, to changing all that. So we'll talk about that. And then finally, we talk about a little scene movie that they made for Showtime called Dirt. Uh, it's a movie about an illegal immigrant woman in New York City who works as a maid for wealthy people. And again, tragic, funny, riveting, and multilingual. Uh, that film is in both English and Spanish, which along with the fact that it's got a cast of largely unfamiliar faces, makes it almost a documentary-like experience to watch it, and it's not. It, you know, it, it's another piece of beautifully crafted storytelling. So that's what's coming up. Here from the summer of 2022 is my conversation with Nancy Savoca and Rich Gay. I'm putting up my whole next batch of wine. Every drop. I bet. My only ticket to the Met. Madam Butterfly. Madam who? Get out of here with that. All right. It's my good conduct, my United States Army. Hmm. My life savings. Plus the shop. <laughs> Do me a favor, keep the shop. <laughs> if I win, you open that door and keep it open till I say quit. I lose, you give my daughter Catherine. On second thought, I'll take the shop. <laughs> Ooh. I'm kidding. I'll take your daughter. Let's see what we got here. After that comes um, uh, Household Saints, which is, I, I'm i guessing, not as lavish a production, but it certainly is a very, uh, you know, you're still beyond certainly where you were with your first film. Yeah. And you have Jonathan Demme as, a, I assume, the executive producer, the, the force behind getting it to... Uh, obviously, Ira. along with both of you. Yeah. But well, I, you know, how did I, that come? How did that get set up? And... Well, Household Saints again has a you know little story. Nancy, when she was out, still at NYU, was working as an intern at a place called New Day Films, um, and they were she was doing coverage, and they were looking. I guess they were looking for young adult stuff, and so she was covering 
she, she got handed the book, the novel, Household Saints, because it had gotten a good review in the New York Times. This was like 1981 or something? I think it was, yeah, it was still I a, think so. I was and an intern she at NYU, yeah. Went, like, she went nuts over this book, like insane. Like she wrote, you know what you know what coverage is, which is like usually like, what, two pages, right? She wrote like, I don't know, 15, 18 pages about this book. And she was like, oh my God, you have to make this into a movie. Uh, and the, I think their response was, a movie about a girl who wants to be a saint? I don't think so. Right? Yeah, they, they, this was a company that was doing like sex education films for kids. So yeah. it was like, we were looking for children's stories. For and children's It was not you know. what they were looking for. And so Nancy wrote a fan letter to Francine. Basically said, I'm an NYU student film student and I I love this book so much and one day I am going to make I want to make a movie out of it. And that was that. You know, that was the end. I mean, we had no we weren't going to go optioning things or paying for anything like that. We hadn't that. even made true love at that point. No. Wrote so we made true love and then when with Dogfight again, we go back to this, the nice part about having some resources and getting actually getting paid and we I said, "Well, what do you want? You know, we got a little money. What do you what do you want to do?" And she said, I want to I want to go get that book, Household Saints. And so while we were in pre-production, I reached out to Francine. When we came back from C- Seattle uh, that fall, we, we went and, and met with her. And, you know, she, she I, I, I may be mistaken, but I think she still had that letter. No, she did have. She so when we met Francine, she had the fan letter. Right. And I because I remember like thinking when I wrote it, I didn't. I kind of just said everything I wanted, what that story did to me. Um, and I think that that letter really, I think, is the reason why we made the movie. But at that point, we couldn't get the rights to Household Saints because um, I think American, Ma- not American Masters. So there was a PBS company. Somebody had had American it before, Playhouse. so we had to wait. No. They, were know, doing, we had wait. they were doing, they were doing, yeah. But uh, it ultimately, it we ultimately did get it. But I'd say on, on Household Saints, the, the, again, that was Peter Newman that was instrumental in getting the in putting it together, it was a very really complicated deal. He found a, a an equ, a, you know an equity investor uh, that and, and paired it. You know, Peter Newman, Ira Deutschman was just found, you know just fine found line. a fine line. Um, they really helped to put it together because Ira convinced New Line International, uh, and then of course the the incredible Larry Estes, any filmmaker from the '90s, know, knew Larry at, at Columbia TriStar Home Video. So it was like four companies that came together for a really kind of a small budget, like five million dollar budget, and for a really weird movie, and a really weird movie. <laughs> like, oh yeah, what was what was on their like, minds? What the hell were you thinking? <laughs> it was great. I remember going to Ira Deutschman's office. And he said something that I can't imagine being said at any point today, which was, I don't get this story. I don't understand. It, actually, Catholic girls make me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm betting on you as a director. Wow. that's uh, That was yeah. the only time I ever heard it. But never, damn, never heard that again. <laughs> damn, thank you. <laughs> You, you and I have both worked multiple times with Michael Rispoli. Oh, I was just going to say that, and, yes. And, and, and Michael was the first actor I ever worked with who I saw so much so much prep, so detailed, so, you know, and, and then as if it's effortless, just coming right out of his skin, you know. Yeah. Yeah, this lovely, lovely, like a musician, like, a, like he's playing, like. Yeah, and I and I was and I was so I remember being like that. This is I've I've never seen an actor be this conscientious and careful and and really wanting to know. It, it was almost a little daunting at first, you know. Um, but yeah, and then, so when I when I when I rewatched Household Saints, oh. <clears throat> and it's you know it, I'm going like this is kind of the same era that we worked together. He looks the same. It's kind of the same neighborhood. It's the same, yeah. you know. And it just was such a wonderful kind of trip back. A vul- he's got this vulnerability. Yeah. He's he looks like such a tough guy, and then you just there's so much that goes on. There's so much going on with him. I remember my favorite scene, which is not even in the novel that we wrote mm. for Household Saints, is when um, Teresa's a little girl and she's going across the street, and he's Uncle Nicky and he's sitting outside um, the the repair shop. And he calls her over, 
to talk about the family story and doesn't really give her the whole family story, but kind of hints at stuff. And and just we shot that in the afternoon, didn't we? And mm-hmm. and the morning we had a you know a scene of course that takes place like you know ten years earlier. And we came back from lunch, and when we went to rehearse the scene, I hadn't seen him come out of uh, wardrobe and makeup and stuff. He was already in, in his place, and I, I gasped. I mean, I I didn't even want to tell him the, the effect he had on me, but he cha- he aged. <laughs> It's a heartbreaking moment in the movie. Yeah, he's he's a broken guy. Yeah. And and yeah. you don't really know quite how. It's partly in his body. It's partly in his... Yeah, yeah. And then and when he, he gives her the money at the end... And, and he, she's, and he mm-hmm. got the puff... Like, I look, makeup can only do so much. There was something that happened to him. Um, it's funny. It's like, like almost like I'm having the same reaction now that I had when I saw him. It, it kind of broke my heart. His um, he He had that alcoholic puffiness, you know? And um, I almost didn't want to talk to him. I almost, I just wanted to leave him because I knew he was, he, I don't think I spoke to him much. And, and, and my goodness, the little girl, Rachel Bella, when she came to him, just watching the two of them was just so incredible. That's when, my favorite part of directing, it's like the best seat in the house. You know, when you're sitting there and you're watching people do a thing, and you, the smartest the thing you can do yeah. is keep your mouth shut. Yeah. You know, because yeah. it's happening. It's just happening. And then, of course, you have Michael singing to Madame Butterfly. <laughs> yeah. which is, oh, uh, such a great <laughs> shot. There he is. I was like, is that really him doing that? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and see, yeah, look, and look at all the thing, the changes that he goes through in that story. I, Nikki's one of my favorite characters of Household Saints. I told that to Francine when we met. She, it's, he's one of my favorite characters because he's such an outsider. You know, he's gone out to see in the world and then comes back in the neighborhood and he doesn't fit in at right, all. Right, I saw the old lady to send us over. It's delicious. Sure is. And it's a good thing you think so. Because this is it, you know. This is your life from now on. I can't eat this shit. What's your problem? You know what my problem is? Some guys, their lives are beautiful, full, like opera. Guys like us, all we got is sausage, pinochle. What are you, stupid? What's wrong with sausage? Could be worse. There are worse things in life than sausage and pinochle. One, Falcon Eddie's haven't got a pot to pee in. It's funny because, um, uh, you know, I said <clears throat> earlier that I, I look at, you know, true love, and that's like, you know, w- w- what really happens to these people at the end, you know, same with, same with dogfight. In Household Saints, I, one of the things I find so interesting is that if you, let's say you go to that neighborhood and you see that couple in their 60s or maybe 70s now, how did they meet? We'd like to believe everyone meets and it's romantic and it's charming, whatever. But no, they may have, anyone randomly you see on the street may well have met in the, like I say, the anti-romantic, <laughs> you know, deli scene, which is just, it's the least charming f- introduction, the least charming meet cute imaginable, you know, mm-hmm. what, I, what can I do with my thumb? You know, I mean, you're like, this is not going to work out, is it? Yeah. But I think what you're saying in that is, no, this kind of works differently for any couple that meets, yeah. and they kind of pursue it, and it may not look like much, but yeah. it works. Yeah, I think, you know, that's, I think part of that is growing up with antiheroes in the 70s and movies. I think that's really, I would, I just loved um, the unexpected, because I was born around a lot of romance, and certainly, you know, my adolescent sisters and their boyfriend, you know, boys, and and my mom played romantic music and ballads in the house. And so I always had the romance was all around me. I kind of really loved kicking down the store, the door on that. And, and I think that's very much the movies of our time of late 60s, early 70s, where it was rough. And New York was really rough. And that's the New York I knew. Right. So it's just kind of like, you know, you kind of set up what should be romantic. And then you look behind the curtain and say, like, no. <laughs> 
Yeah. I don't. I don't have the advantage of knowing the novel. Um, mm-hmm. I, did it? Did it change much? Because it feels like a novel. No, it's, it's very. It, it, very it's, it's not like any n- normal screenplay would be structured. Or it, do, it doesn't take you anywhere that you would think uh, a movie would it's normally take you. It's very faithful. In fact, I think the one scene that is in the movie that's not in the novel. Um, there are things in the novel that just we couldn't write or we didn't make it into the movie, of course. But the one scene that we wrote that is not in the novel is this Rispoli scene. With the little girl. With the, With little, the little Teresa. That's, that's the one not, scene because we needed a connector at that point. Yeah, we needed a piece to, to connect to, him. And, to sort of explain the, the situation, the yeah. But, but that novel, I mean, for me, it's like I love the novel. Why would I change it? I mean, that was she, the reason why I wanted to make the movie. So that's what I said to Francine. I, the 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 world that you set up and the ambience and that surreal thing that's going on and that kind of magic out of the corner of your eye. Did I just see something? That's that's in the novel, and I wanted to bring that on the screen. And you know, you have to figure out the adaptation yeah. of that, but. And she was, Nancy is so faithful, because when we write together, we always have some, I don't know, we always have work out some way of working. You know, I'll take a first pass, or she'll take a first pass, or we divvy up the characters in, in, in different ways. But in that one, she took the first pass. And I think the novel is 200 pages, and the first draft of the script was about 270. I mean, it was... <laughs> Unbelievable. I didn't uh, want to cut out she anything. Didn't want, and I it was, was like, so good. obviously, we can't do this. Uh, but it was, I felt like um, like a monk, you know, like transcribing. It felt very much like I needed to really to kind of bring in, just bring the novel into me, you know. And I think that, that I wasn't thinking about how long or short it was going to be. I just needed to put everything down. And then I called Rich, Rich the Butcher. <laughs> he yeah. went in, he took it, slash, 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 came back and said, What do you think of that? I'm like, Ah! Yeah, yeah, but um, and then we had to figure it out. Did you did you share your script with the author? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the the best compliment we got. I think was from um, Francine's husband Howie, who said um, that that with the little connectors that we did in the scene with Mike, um, he said, "I I don't know when Francine leaves and you begin." And I was like, "Oh, okay, that's really that's what we want. That's what we." I didn't want the novel to change it. I wanted it to, can, like, translate it. I wanted it to be like a translator, you know, a new, the, that other language. Mm. It's still working, let's go. Let's go. Big winner here tonight, big winner. We don't start till we sell off from last night. Sell or what? What do you mean, what? You don't remember? Love me God, I don't remember. Your daughter. Catherine? What about her? You bet her last night for a blast of cold air from the meat locker. That's crazy. I must have been out of my mind. Let's go. Where'd you go? Nobody deals. Not till we settle up. What a joker. Come on, San Angelo. You don't want Catherine. Uh, see, the sausage she cooked just backed up on me. You shut your mouth. She bought that sausage in this shop. Do you know what it is to be a man, fucking Eddie? It means you pay up. Come on. What kind of man bets his daughter in a pinochle game? I see. So you're not a man. So you go play canasta with the women. Come on. Go. Ah. I bet Catherine. Nikki, is this true? Nikki, where were you? It's right here. (laughs) Jesus Christ, I don't believe this is happening. Come on, fucking Eddie. It's not what you think. My intentions are good. I'm serious. I'm talking about a church wedding. Everything on the up and up. Nobody will ever know. This story will never leave this room. Right? Sure. If you ask me, I think you're nuts. (laughs) Yeah, I'm crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Let's drink to it. Come on. 
Put them up. Come on, put them up. Nikki, come on. Salute. Salute. <laughs> now, was Tracy Ullman's participation a big piece of getting the movie going? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was, she yeah. was very active at that point, and, and I remember I was just amazed when she said she was, she'd be interested. And she was, she was really interesting because she, um, I brought her to the Bronx. I had her meet a bunch of women. Uh, because I knew she would just soak everything in and, you know, the character would be... She was going to approach building a character different than some of the actors I knew because she had her own way. So I just knew exposure, exposure, you know. Um, but what she surprised me uh, was after she had met everybody, she said, now I want you to... Can you do me a favor? Can you read all my lines? And, you know, back in the day it was cassette. You know, can you record them? So I want to play them back. Because she was going to use my accent, which is interesting. Because I don't know that I have a Bronx accent, like real, a Bronx, New York accent, that much. But maybe well, you have a closer one than she does. Yeah, so yeah. She, yeah. So she was kind of, you know, and and so sometimes I could hear like a little bit of it was like an echo. It's like, oh, that's really weird. Like, oh, she got that from me. You know, she would say something, and I'm like, oh, like what? You know, I kind of would recognize it. So that was kind of interesting. But yeah, yeah, she was very much uh, that detail of picking up, and you just didn't know what what she was going to need. So you give her everything, whatever she's asking. Right, right. You know, when I was little, the nuns told me a beautiful story about the Virgin and the Angel Gabriel. You know the Annunciation, right? When Gabriel visits Mary and he tells her that she's going to give birth to the Son of God. Well, right after he did this, he's just about ready to fly off. But Mary grabs him by the tip of his wing and holds him back like this. And she says... Excuse me, but this thing that is happening to me, is it a miracle? Oh, yes, says Gabriel. And he's just about ready to fly off again. And again, she grabs him and holds him back. And this baby that I'm going to give birth to, will that be a miracle too? Oh, yes, he said. That's always a miracle. But this birth will be the greatest one of all. And he goes to her, you know, Madonna, Miracles are all around us, but life is too short to sit around and wait for them. We are the ones who must seek them out. I don't get it. Honey, the point is, who knows? Maybe the story of the letter was made up by the guy who sells souvenirs at Fatima. Or maybe the Virgin is trying to teach us what Gabriel taught her. That life is too short to sit around and wait for a miracle. It, yeah, it, it, it's 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 a it's a beautiful and unusual film. And what what was the? I mean, I remember it's really it's really the first of your movies I knew. I went back later and saw uh, uh, the others, including including um, Dogfight, which I didn't see when it was initially released. Many but, people didn't. It was, it was well, yeah, I guess yeah. that was the that, that was the revenge. And, and yet, which I find, and you and I spoke about this a little, on, you know, on the phone. Um, it, Astonishingly to me, well, dogfight you can find on Amazon Prime. Yeah, I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say it doesn't look like either Household Saints no. or True Love are available. No. Except well, you were kindly sent me Vimeos, and, but. That, well, and that's where our group Missing, Missing Movies movie. comes yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we saw this problem, you know, years ago when. When we went transition from VHS to DVD, how some of our movies didn't even make that transition, and there's no DVD of Household Saints. Of Household Saints, no, no. That's, no. that's absurd. And people, you know, writing asking for it. Yeah. You know, what do we? You know, how? Where can we get it? And the answer is, uh, and, and it's interesting. The assumption is that the filmmaker knows where things are, and that's you know what what we want to educate people now with this group called Missing Movies is that filmmakers often don't know what happens to their films after they make them because they get, you know, picked up by a distributor and then, you know, and then it moves through all these different channels and either it goes, it transitions to the the next technology, which today is streaming, or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, why didn't it? Maybe the company that financed your movie uh, is holding on to it and isn't sure what to do with it, or it was went bankrupt, out of business, somebody died. Um, there's so many reasons why the movies we love uh, are unavailable for us to see. And we learned it with our films. And, and when we started struggling yeah, with started, our so finding Part our of movies. this was also, I mean, we watch, I mean, we're, 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 we remain close friends with John 
uh, Sales and, and Maggie. And, you know, they, Maggie's been in, basically made it her full time job to track down every one of John's films and make sure that they're available. Uh, so I, I, again, you know, having a mentor, having someone who's leading the way, uh, I watched her go after uh, The Secret of Ron Inish. Um, and when we couldn't find it, actually, it, actually, the thing that really kickstarted again was Ira Deutschman called me looking for a print of, How, of Household Saints because he wanted to s screen it, uh, I think at Columbia, where he teaches, uh, for, for, a, for, for some event. And, and uh, I said, well, I had a couple of prints and I, I sent them to UCLA Film Archive. And so he reached out and was told that the prints were not very good quality and they were afraid that if they lent them out that they would be, you know, putting through a projector, they would be damaged. And so it's we started on this quest along with Ira and we were able to find, you know, he, um, you know, in fairness, the rights had expired and I was completely unaware. Uh, you know, part of the problem with being in the film business is you, I'm not thinking about, him, you know, 30 years the from past, now yeah. when I'm making a movie I'm just trying to get this movie made and I'm trying to figure out how to get the next movie made uh, so a lot of it is not paying attention not being aware and so the rights had expired for Warner Brothers so we tried to we, you know I made a, a phone call and whoever I got on the phone said oh yeah well, the rights expired so we don't have that stuff anymore I'm like well where are all the materials I delivered Oh, I don't know. They might have they, they might have been destroyed. I don't know. And I'm like, what? You know. And I went back to Ira, and Ira actually reached co called uh, Toby Emmerich, and got and Toby and suddenly I got a phone call from the head of the vault at Warner Brothers, and yeah, we got we got the Household Saints here. Where do you want it? And I was like, what do you, what do you mean you got it? And he said, well, there's about a hundred boxes. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Where do you and I said, Well, I don't want it at Not my Not in my place. <laughs> uh, but fortunately we had all well, again a hundred bucks of negative? Well there was no no negative actually. The negative I had retrieved from Duart. But the sound I didn't have any of the sound. Oh, I had okay. the film negative, thirty five negative when Duart closed. They reached they co contacted me and I had that shipped to UCLA. Um, but all the sound materials and stuff. No, but they had, you know, they had the, uh, the tape, the D1 Masters, the all the audio tracks, all the publicity stuff. I mean, it's like a treasure chest. I mean, we have all the original EPK interviews with Jonathan and Tracy and yeah. Francine and Nancy and all and that. Vince, yeah. um, so we were able, long story short, long story, it was a three-year endeavor for us to we reacquire the rights. Um, and uh, Kino Lorber is is uh putting it out to milestone is uh is restoring it and uh, it'll be out next year for the 30th anniversary on. with a book uh it'll be well it'll be a, there'll be a little theatrical thing we hope it'll be on dvd it'll be streaming uh they're doing a 4k restoration uh and in the course of doing that i was able to also connect true love Kino has a deal with MGM for a certain number of titles a year. So True Love will also be restored and, and be uh, uh, available next year for That's streaming uh, and, and DVD. So, yeah, it's a, it's a success story, but it led us to realize how... How huge the problem is. Problem I mean, it, 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 when, when we saw what we had to go through, all we could think of is we're not the only ones. And that's when um, I approached Mary Herron and I'm like, how about we do something for the DGA... Well, and it turns out I shot Andy Warhol is not available. That's what, right. Every time I That's speak like, to a filmmaker about something, then I hear which of their movies are not available. Yeah. We all have it. Which of yours are not available? I, uh, my first feature, Cafe Society, yeah. is missing in action. Yeah. Uh, two Family House has been in limbo since Lionsgate's, you know, thing expired, license expired, and I hear they're trying to get it on streaming. But no, you could. You can go to my website and see them. Right. That's right, kind of you right. know. It's no, a, I right. think that's really the, smart those, that those you do Those two that. are the other ones are the other ones are all there, but the first two and they're like kind of the most important in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and those are yeah they're yeah. they're floating around somewhere. Well, it, well, we you know, 
keep talking. We're going to try. Yeah. We've so, got a website that is definitely in the works right now, but um, our goal is to connect people with with people who who might be able to help them. We when we we had an article that came out in um, IndieWire. And the re- the reaction to that article, we got so many emails at our website, and people like lawyers volunteering. So we've got we've got a lot of interest, a lot of people that want to help out. And then we learned of all these organizations that are doing their own. Basically, it just reminds me of you know, like when um, in the '60s when the River Arno overflowed and the and the library in Florence was like the books were getting wet. I had a friend of mine who said I was there in '65 when we used to take the books and try and get them out and dry them up and you know these like hundred year old books, hundreds of years old books. I feel like that's what we're doing with film. Like we, we have to quickly save them. Yeah. And then and there are def- you know, definitely the more established ways of restoration stuff, and that's super important work that's being done. But if you if people don't have the resources for that, still there are ways to save them, and and our hope is to put out information on how to do that. Yeah, it it, it seems like it seems like this has been a problem with movies since the beginning. Since they're the they're beginning. cumbersome to store, and and companies don't really value them once they're initial. Well, you know, so they don't want to deal with them. They don't want to store them. There's too much material. There's da, da, da. and so they they kind of let them go. And I mean, you know, I, I forget what the figure is, but like most silent film is vanished. Exactly. Right. The, the, what, right. What's yeah. left that's out there is a little tiny percentage of what was shot. Yeah. Um, well, in digging through stuff, in what one of the th- part of what we, we, I mean, we're basically missingmovies.org is basically about uh, education, information, and advocacy. Right. Uh, and then just in uh, a, a fairly simple search, look at the Sundance films from 1979 through I think it was 2005. Uh, one of our one of our working group members got through, um, and in that period, there are 1,400 titles that are not available. So these were films that were 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 selected to the premiere festival. Yeah, these are the yeah that's the in, best in that the was United going States. on, and this they're is like it. yeah and. They're just, you can't see them. And that means that, you know, the actors in those films, I mean, you know, again, Nancy decide, Nancy and Mary said, let's do a webinar for the DGA and let's reach out to some filmmakers to see if, you know, if they want to be on this panel. Oh, Mira Nair, Mississippi, Mississippi Masala, Masala with Denzel Washington is not available. Yeah. No. You know, no. Kiss of the Spider Woman. Those two, by the way, are coming out. They 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 have been uh, restored, and as we call them, they are they will be found soon. Mm. But you know, it's amazing how how many what very we're, and what we're missing titles. out on. You know, what people are missing out on is uh, to me, I think, is what's important. To let the audiences know it's you're missing out because there's a there's a, a feeling you think that everything is streamable. You think everything is on the internet, and you can you know it's just a matter of like finding it or getting on the right subscription so that that has the movie you want. But the fact is that. There are a lot less movies available now than there were when you had your mom and pop video store. When you yeah, had- exactly. The vi- yeah, the video store disappearing is such an odd. You, you, you yeah. would you wouldn't you would have thought that by now the technology would have made that so obsolete, and yet yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad that the DVD is still. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. like a nice hard copy of a DVD yeah, yeah, to yeah. me is still so much more secure feeling than it's parked on some in the air somewhere and i you know that's where my movie don't, you up. can't you can't own it you know you it comes and goes you can't own it like there was a, a brief time I, you know that between vhs and dvd where you could actually purchase movies and own them which is kind of wonderful and then you can show them to to each other and you can have conversations about it and you can show them to the younger generation and let them know that this stuff is is here i want to talk to you about dirt before we before we 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 end so this is a this is a deeply sad movie, and yet, like all of your other <laughs> movies, it's always really funny too. Oh, uh, good! Like, you can't quite. You, <laughs> it, you got me thinking. Like, the, gra- no, no, the, the ground <laughs> yeah. like shifts under your feet with with your movies sometimes, yeah. and yeah. and I feel like none so much as as, as with Dirt. Yeah. Um, it's also very daring in that you know you've made this movie that's in two languages, mm. so you're hearing. Two languages spoken, which means if you're watching the subtitled version, you're sometimes reading English and sometimes reading Spanish. So it, it, it's it, you know it's so it's challenging on a number of levels. It's also cast with nobody who you know, so it kind of feels like a doc mm. a lot of the time. And it, the first thing I want to ask you is: Did Showtime pay for it, or did they buy it from you? Because how did you get this done? It's a complicated film, obviously. Well, You're also okay. shooting in other countries, and another slightly complicated story. Yeah, another. Okay. So, we'll so it, it began with um, I think it was a TV agent at my agency who said to me, um, "Do you have any?" This was, and this was in two thousand 
1991 or something. Do you have anything no, to pitch? Actually, to, yeah, it was 2000. actually 1999. Oh, 1999, Jesus. Yeah. Um, do you have anything to pitch, any TV ideas? And I, I said, no, I don't, because I, I don't think in terms of episodes. Uh, but then I thought, at the same time that that was happening, in my neighborhood in Rockland County, um, there were a lot of people coming in from Central America and Mexico uh, to work, you know, the women were mostly domestic workers and the guys were working in the, uh, either in construction or, or landscaping. And um, because I'm bilingual, I, I would sometimes translate in school for the parents because my kids were going, to, we were all going to the same public schools. So I would be translating. And then a girlfriend of mine had this idea, a uh, really good idea of like, she would help the children who had just arrived um, with their English, like in first and second grade, to learn to read. And then we would hire an English teacher to teach the moms because the husbands of these immigrants were learning on the job, but the women were doing domestic work and they were mostly insulated, so they weren't learning English. So we learned that, the, that the, these women who had these little kids didn't want to attend a class because they usually had babies and toddlers and didn't trust leaving them anywhere else. So I volunteered with my kids to babysit the, these little babies while their moms in the same room learned English. And what came of that was, uh, because I was also between that and helping translate at the schools, I got to know these moms. And they started telling me the stories of how they got to the, the U.S. And at that time, people weren't talking a lot about the crossing and the going through the desert and getting getting in through the border and all that. And all I keep thinking is, oh my God, these are traumatized refugees. And here we are in Rockland County suburbia, and you could go to the supermarket and you know be online next to somebody who's just arrived and is traumatized. And we have no idea. So after a while of lots of these stories, I realized that there were so many stories you could definitely have a series and deal with all the aspects of what somebody goes through. And so I said, you know, I do have an idea to pitch a TV series, um, kind of like an American upstairs, downstairs. How about a domestic worker and the people that she works for and how people don't really know each other? You know, if you're a domestic worker, you know so much more about the family you work for and the people that you work for don't really know too much about you. So that would be kind of an interesting dynamic and it would bring in immigration and it would bring in class which in this country we don't talk about class either. Uh, Mrs. Ortega gave me these things of your mother when she died. But, but there are some, some photographs, and some letters. I already went through them, Dolores. It's all garbage. You know, Dolores, uh, I need to tell you something. I don't know nothing. No, you don't understand, Dolores. I, um, we need to let you go. But, but why? What did I do? I'm sorry, Dolores. It's just that this whole thing with the election, you know, Claudia's taking a hard stand against illegals in the city. Y bueno, si, si los periódicos se llegan a enterar, la prensa se llega a enterar de que te estamos dando empleo, la van a crucificar en los periódicos. Huh? Nobody will back her and she won't be able to run. ¿Pero quién se va a enterar? Yo llevo 12 años viviendo en este país. Soy, soy, soy invisible. Yo soy una persona muy callada. Se lo juro que nadie se va a enterar por mí. I know, Dolores. Trust me, it's not me. Okay, I know we can trust you. It's Claudia. I mean, she can't be convinced. But, Mr. Manny, this is my biggest job. I am 24 hours a week here. Okay, okay, I get it. Don't worry about it, okay? I'll get you some severance pay. Just wait here and I'll get my checkbook. I don't take checks. Okay, fine. Fine. Look, this is all I got right now, okay? Nothing on us. But I'll tell you what. This afternoon, I'll get some more money, huh? And I'll put it in an envelope and I'll give it to Flaherty, okay? Now, please, go. Don't you want me to finish? No, no, no. We just want you to go. Okay? He trabajado con usted nueve años, ¿sabe? Conozco a su hijo desde que... Ya sé, ya sé, Dolores. Okay? 
I told you. I'm going to leave an envelope downstairs with flyer. And I pitched it. <laughs> and most, most everyone turned it down. Um, but there was this one guy. Actually, there was this one guy in CBS who heard the pitch. And he said, that's really interesting. Because, you know, I grew up. I, we had a housekeeper. And I remember when I was like 17, I came out of my bedroom one day. I was kind of half naked. I had my underwear on. And Maria was cleaning. And I was like, oh, oops. I got in my underwear. But it's only Maria. So I just said hi, and I just watched her face. She was a little freaked out, and I just laughed. And this was the, the executive to me, and I was like, yeah, that's kind of like the stories I wanted to tell. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what <laughs> you know? and, um, But he passed. Um, so, but Showtime was really interested. So, Yeah, so Showtime, so Showtime said yes. I mean, I, and I wasn't, I wasn't there, uh, and I actually, the idea must have been percolating in, Nancy, percolating in Nancy's head because we didn't really discuss it even. I mean, maybe she mentioned it, the, the thought, but she went out to L.A. on her own, and she had these meetings, and I got a, she called me back and said, I don't know, I just started pitching this idea. And, you know, and I think they liked it at Showtime, and she told me all the other, you know, the, the other stories. And, yeah, and Showtime said, yeah, they wanted it. And uh, better than that for us was they wanted a, a two-hour pilot, which is the format we knew. The, the idea was a half hour series, but the pilot, they wanted two hours. And I was like, oh, that's, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, yeah, that's great. You know, and uh, so we wrote it as a script. To, we wrote it together. Um, I f first of all, I went to these ladies and I said, listen, I said, you probably don't know this about me because you're you know, I'm like a mom in the neighborhood translating in school. I said, I, I actually I'm a storyteller and I do movies and the stories you're telling me are really important stories. And I would never single out anybody here because a lot of people were undocumented. But if I could weave them together so it's like one character, would you guys give me permission to use your experiences? And they, they were very enthusiastic and they said yes. As a matter of fact, they were so enthusiastic that um, we, when we shot in El Salvador, we stayed in, the, in several houses of this one family we knew. And the, their family, or the family, Dolores' family in the movie, was like the mom and sisters of a yeah. friend I, I know. We made great connections in that. They were the wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. And we're still friends. With, and I have to them. tell you, what was really interesting, as we were doing the research and stuff, I, I spoke to a lot of other you know, Latin American friends, and they were like, Salvadorans? you're never going to get Salvadorans to open up to you. They're like, really? And I knew it's because there's a civil war going on and, you know, people get really, you know. And they said, there, it's going to be really hard. Like, you could switch it to another group. And But I was just, the people I knew were from El Salvador. So I was like, I really want to do a Salvadoran. And what I realized when we went to El Salvador and we started interviewing the families and talking to the families, and we ended up, like, hearing all these incredible stories the formality with which they met us and sitting down in people's homes to have a little cup of coffee and some cookies, I felt like I was in Sicily. I felt like I was in my father's land. And I realized there's a lot of similarities between El Salvador and Sicily in that these are countries that there's a lot of violence, there's a lot of... Um, people that take advantage of that violence so that they can um, control situations. And there's a lot of fear. And that's what they had in common. And so I, I felt, and plus there's volcanoes. <laughs> so I, re I recognize the volcano and I recognize the people and the way they were. And I recognize this formality and this closed offness to a certain point. And once you get past that point, this sense of humor that's mm -hmm. really dark. And I just went, oh, like, I know I, I'm not from El Salvador, but I, I have a way. I, I understand something here. And so just in those conversation stuff, it was just they really opened up. They were pretty amazing. And by the end, like we were sleeping over. We, we used people's homes. We had meals. Um, and we told the story that we hoped is the beginning. I mean, there's so much that needs to be said about El Salvador. But yeah. Um, it was just um, it was one of one of the most amazing experiences. So, so we wrote the script, and yeah. of course, Showtime was like. When they read the, it was kind of like the script, reaction of Dog Fight. It's like, not oh, really. You know, is this what is this what we asked for? We don't think this is a series for us. Thank you very much. 
And so back in those days, it was kind of rare. You know, they don't give those things back. I mean, you write that for you write a TV thing, and, or, you know, a pilot and stuff, and it's like they they're not going to they let it. they're not going to let someone else take it and make some a hit out of it, for example. So there's a policy against that, and I and I just really argued strenuously with the I was the creative executive in business affairs, and I said, listen, I really I really want to get this back. It's important. It's an important movie, and I know how to make it for for no money. And they said, well, how much? Would you make it for? And I completely, it was just complete bluster. I, I, I had no clue. I said, under a million dollars. And they said, I could have huh. killed them. I, I could have killed like, them. You could have, was just, oh <laughs> my God. No, I could have said anything. Just... <laughs> I was just trying to get the damn thing back. And I also was mindful that if they were going to charge, you know, if they were going to, like, if I had to reimburse what they paid us and their expense, you know, the turnaround costs, I didn't want to have a quarter of a million dollars in reversion costs, you know, to, to pay back. So I, I was lowballing it. And the creative said, well, you know, we've been talking um, about, you know, uh, it was Jerry Offsay at the time, and he has this concept of like six-figure features. And maybe this would work for us. And that's basically what happened. I mean, they made a couple of those. I think there was a movie called The Mudge Boys that was was one of those. There were a couple of low budget films that the, you know that he, Jerry had been thinking about doing, um, and but they were very from a production standpoint, they didn't want to know. It was like, give me the cash flow. We're going to put the money in the you know the money gets wired every week, but. They don't want any they were part very of the production because they had so no again, idea. An accidental indie movie, yeah, an accidental indie movie, and and of course, you know, we're shooting in another country, and we're shooting in El Salvador, which has no infrastructure for film. So we had to come in with with our equipment, which on day one was held up. Yeah, I mean, it was a, you know, it, it was an adventure, but we shot basically the movie was shot in Queens, Manhattan, and yeah. and El Salvador. But I also saw a Mexico unit on the. What what's that at the at the end credits? It says. Um, oh, we called it Mexico. <laughs> it was it was Mexico, meaning uh, my backyard in Rockland County. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we actually. Oh boy, oh, yeah, the, what we the, did for the, that the, movie. The Portisan. The Portisan was. I actually show that in my film classes. If you want, you know, be creative. That Portisan was sitting in my backyard, and you know. I had those those we we had those poor actors in there and we were just rocking our sons it our sons who were really have good strong kids were rocking it back same and forth thing. so we had child labor the same thing with the desert <clears throat> the Mexico desert that was the sky in El Salvador was always extraordinary we had these beautiful sunsets and so we went to the rooftop of our hotel and there was a little there was a wall so you no we set up tables yeah we had to set up a table because there was a wall there so we set up these very long tables and we had the we had the actors walk across and the just low angle against that sky right. yeah and that was the Mexico yeah. desert and everybody run <laughs> I, I <laughs> on mean the and, table. and so often people forget like the, that that's the idea of, you know you don't have to travel to yeah you know to far off places you yeah. don't need everything to no. you, you know there, there's so much you can do with with so little in, in movies yeah. especially if you come from the yeah. world that you come from. Oh, You've and, learned to make anything work. In Dirt, that when she comes back into the country, I mean, she's at JFK. I mean, we couldn't, this was post 9 11, we couldn't shoot at JFK. So, um, City College. City College. Mm -hmm. A lot the of the bursar's the, office. Yeah, a lot of the stuff you know, was City College. It's really tight. And also, it works really tight shots. Why? Because it's really a, a, a nerve wracking moment. You, you're looking at her, you're looking at the guy who's deciding whether he's going to let her in or not, right. and you're not going to do a wide shot of that. What kind of a release did, did Dirk get? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think... Oh, that kind of release, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, the problem was, I mean, we finished shooting in El Salvador, and I called the executives to say, we finished, and she said, that's great, congratulations. So, like, how much Spanish is in this? And I was like, uh, well, she's Salvadoran. She's Salvadoran, and a lot of the movie is in El Salvador, and they don't really speak English here. Uh, and when she's at home, like they had been so hands off that they really didn't understand. They didn't know what 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 they did. And so their big game plan for the film was to to get it into Sundance. And when it didn't get into Sundance, because partly because we finished shooting in September and we had like three or four, like what do we have, four weeks, five weeks of cutting to, to actually show anything and it was, you know, it was really incomplete. But uh, when it didn't get in Sundance, it was kind of like, oof, what do yeah. we do with this thing? 
And so and on a regime change. And a regime change. By that point, Jerry Offsay was gone. And and it was political. I mean, it's a, you know, immigration and stuff. So it wound up uh, not actually getting aired until two. Th- we shot it in 2002, and it didn't get aired until 2005. Um, and it did. We we got a WGA nomination for the for the original teleplay, uh, but you know it didn't get much of a release at all. And it is another missing movie that I'm pursuing. Oh, is it? Yeah. Well, yeah. we keep getting. We you know we get asked people. Mostly people in academia know about it because they use it a lot for you know college um, courses and gosh in uh, let's see labor uh, immigration. Women's <laughs> women's mm. studies. Yeah, we had a it's lot funny. of, really all, of that, all these yeah. little <laughs> all these yeah. little things. Um, but um, y- yeah, so so we get asked a lot. So we just give the you know like you, the Vimeo and the yeah the yeah. password and and yeah. it's connected. You said to the next film you're you're making. Yeah, yeah. In a, in a, in a way, just in topic. I, it's yeah, in uh, topic the, what, what we're doing now is is bit. yeah. So what we're doing, uh, uh, our next film is, is also about immigration, but it's about the border. And um, and I guess in tone, these stories are just so painful that we just look for comedy. So we're doing it uh, as a dramedy. Um, but, yeah, we realized when we were done with Dirt, we thought, okay, we did our story about immigration. And here we are 20-something years later, and it's just getting worse and worse. And so we've got um, a movie now that very similar story yeah. started off as a pitch for a TV series. We got to write the pilot, and then it got put in turnaround. Same same trajectory, and and then over COVID, over my COVID vacation, we we turned it into a film mm. script. Yeah, are you close to going or? We're, we're halfway there. We're halfway there. I, I hope we're we're, there. we should Got the candles lit to the saints. Yeah. Got yeah. it all, you know. Yeah. Um, but we have my soon Zaid as uh, w- w- one of our colleagues and Pascal Armand as another colleague. So um, we got a great cast and uh, we're really excited to I go feel, to the border. I feel, I, feel, I feel like the other thing that they don't talk about enough in film school is patience. Oh, yeah. You have to wait. Oh, years sometimes yeah. and it, and but but you can't let it be gut wrenching because no. you won't survive you, you can't won't survive. you won't live to see your film no. made have a no. life i we tell everybody to. get a life i used to think you didn't you couldn't have a life you have to have a life have a life and also pick your projects so that you do you are ready to you know fall on the sword for it because it's going to ask you for that talk about it. these stories they really have a life of their own they ask for a lot and um so you, if for you to hang with them for that long, it's got to be something you're really passionate about. Thanks for listening to the Movies Till Dawn podcast. There's also a Movies Till Dawn blog where, on a mostly daily basis, I post YouTube videos related to movies, music, urban history, and all kinds of junky cultural artifacts that interest me. If you'd like to experience the Movies Till Dawn blog, go to my website, RaymondDeFelita.org, click on the little tab at the top that says blog, and everything will fall into place. You can even subscribe, and you'll get the posts daily via email, which is a much less annoying way to deal with it. So please come back for more conversations with veteran filmmakers, and explore our podcast site, MoviesTillDawnPodcast.com, to listen to other conversations with filmmaking legends that I've been collecting and posting over the past few years. Thank you.